Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. This evening, we're going to be talking about the Billy Meyer case, particularly. We're going to talk about the overpopulation issue, and we're going to discuss uh, the law of striving again and the law of fulfilling your duty to yourself. I wanted to go back over a little bit of the background information related to who who Billy Meyer is. Edward Albert Meyer is a one-armed farmer. He lives in Switzerland in a beautiful tiny mountain village. It's called Hinterschmidruti. It's about 52 minutes east of Zurich by automobile. Uh, he has a building there. It's called the Semiase Silver Star Center. It's a place where a group meets called the FIGU, which is a free community of interest, which helped Billy with the translation of his material and the uh, dissemination of his various written works. Billy's an incredibly prolific author. He's written 40 books, and one of those books we're going to look at a little bit tonight. It's called The Way to Live. He's, uh, again, written over 40 books and thousands of contact reports, bulletins, and articles of various kinds. Um, His contacts go back to when he was a very young boy growing up in Switzerland uh, before World War II. He lived in northern Switzerland in an area called Bulak, Switzerland. And at that time, he could see the uh, bombers from the United States Air Force flying over and also could see the German planes, including the Stukas, And occasionally one of the um, Swedish, the Air Force from Switzerland would shoot down an American bomber, I guess, and and Billy could see that as well. He would also look at the sky and he could see in the evenings what looked like stars moving around. Later he would understand that those were extraterrestrial crafts. Him and his father one day in broad daylight saw a very large disk which hovered near the steeple of the church in Bulak, Switzerland, where Billy was growing up. Um, About a year after that, Billy started getting uh, these telepathic messages, and they were from uh, an individual named Svath, who was uh, an extraterrestrial man uh, of over 900 years old, who had come to the earth to be a mentor for this young boy, uh, his, his people, the Sfas people, have been called the Pleiadians uh, erroneously here on the earth. They're not from our Pleiades. They're from a star system some 80 light years beyond the Pleiades in a, in a different space-time configuration than we live in. Uh, their star system is called the Pleiades star system, and there's a planet there called Planet Era. And it's very similar to the Earth. It has a slightly higher gravity. It's more like the Earth was about 1,400, 1,300, I would say, something along those lines. Um, These people have lived for 50,000 years without war. They are at a much higher level of elevation, excuse me, uh, of evolution than we are. They they live at the fifth stage of human evolution, and we here at Earth are down here at the second stage. And we're suffering because of our ignorance of a lot of different principles. Um, there are laws in, of nature, uh, the universal awareness, the superintelligence, which guides our universe, which created our universe, which is in charge of the evolution of this universe. It has put certain laws in place. Uh, one of the, you know, the most important law is a special law that we've been studying, trying to wrap our minds around. It's, it's the law of love, and it has nothing to do with affective or romantic love, 
but it's a a love that's based on wisdom and it's a very stable kind of love that it doesn't change over time and um it's based also on understanding a concept called the oneness of the universe that we're all connected and in ways that we don't completely understand yet if you're looking at a tree you're looking at something that you could almost think of as an extension of yourself in some ways and this web of life on the earth is very very important and the policy that we should have is to live and help live and that's difficult in a time particularly in a time of overpopulation Overpopulation affects not only the physical earth, but it affects the spiritual side of things. There's a band of energy around our planet and that the spirit forms uh, live in, so to speak. When your spirit form leaves your body, it goes into this other dimension called the spiritual realm. And um, in that spiritual realm, the memories of the previous life are processed in an area called the overall consciousness block. So your consciousness goes into this area and all of your past life memories are reduced into what they call these essences, which come out to be things like patience and love and and uh, wisdom and kindness and, um, and generosity. And these virtues are converted in kind of a neutral energy form and they strengthen your spirit form and this whole process of going through the past life and and getting the evolutive values out of there is supposed to take about a lifetime and a half so if you've lived 100 years and then you should spend about 150 years in the spiritual realm your spirit form should processing the information that you gain from the last life from your material consciousness. Uh, in a time of overpopulation, the spirit form is pulled back into the body of a child too soon, and that doesn't allow this processing to take place properly. And the side effects that occur is that it weakens maleness. And one of the things we're seeing on the earth is what's called the disappearing male. Part of that is related to overpopulation. And it's not just testosterone levels. It's a psychological, uh, intellectual thing related to the material consciousness. Because it takes time in the spiritual realm to process what has happened in the previous life. And what happens is the spirit form comes in kind of unprepared for the next life. Uh, another side effect is uh, over-dependence on parents. So when children come in they're not independent enough, and it's, again, because of a lack of, of preparation in the spiritual realm. So this, this issue of overpopulation has very, very profound effects. It's something we don't completely understand on the earth. Uh, Billy has an article here. It's called Arahat Athrasada, and it's an overpopulation excerpt. Arahat Athrasada is a spiritual plane that is really the last step for human beings. There are seven stages of evolution that human humans go through, and that's humans on every planet, and not just the Earth. We think of human beings as just being part of Earth, but it's the natural evolution on all planets that we have the plants form, the animals start to form, the higher animals form, and then the human population starts to develop. Probably in every solar system, there's probably at least one planet that forms and can support human life. It has to be in the right position. It has to be in what the scientists call a Goldilocks zone, where it gets the right amount of heat. Um, it also has to be the right size. If it's too big or too small, then the, the gravity isn't correct. And all of these factors have to be just right. But that's what kind of goes to give more credibility to the Meyer information is because when you have a planet that's roughly the size of Earth, it tends to produce creatures that are much 
more analogous to what we see here on the Earth. In fact, on ERA, uh, ERA is very similar to the Earth was before it started to be destroyed by overpopulation. So anyway, um, people think of overpopulation in terms of space. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Now, there's 6 million square miles of Earth available on the South Pole, but they will never be utilized by people. Uh, people are going to live in the areas with fresh water, with good climates, uh, and on arable land, on land that can be produce crops. And, and this reduces the amount of area that we can really have people. Plus, all those forests need to be there to support moderating the weather. Uh, the forests moderate the weather by cooling the ground down in the uh, shaded areas. Most people don't even go into forests anymore, so they have no idea how different the environment is. When you step into a very, very thickly dense forest, uh, the temperature in the summertime will be 15, 20 degrees less than it will be outside of that forest. Uh, and that that thick plant growth, even though the leaves aren't there in the winter, still helps hold some heat in. So we need to learn to understand more about these creational natural laws. Let me read a little bit from this overpopulation excerpt. It says, in the middle of the of all earthly events, the human stands with globally the highest develop spirit form. Animals and plants have spirit forms as well, but we have the highest developed spirit form, and as a result, we have a, a responsibility to be kind of custodians uh, of the earth. He has all things of this world to place into order and to value them according to all-encompassing unitary law of creational order recognizing in all earthly laws of nature. So we have to start to um, learn these laws of nature and then put things in the right order. Now, what we're doing on the earth, because of our ignorance, our horrible ignorance of the way the natural order works, we have uncontrolled population that just runs rampant. And I want to give you a few examples here of um, very, very high population that's out of control. Bangladesh is a perfect example. A country the size of Iowa has a population of 167 million people, which, for example, is more people than live in Russia. So, And this is a perfect example because what happens in these third world countries is you have mega cities in that form, with 30 to 40, 50, 60 million people, and these massive slums, about 90% of it is pure slums, where people live under the most ghastly conditions. They barely have any drinking water. So this is the future of the earth if we continue to run out of control with the overpopulation problem. Uh, we need to get this under control big time. So let me continue here. As an individual, the human has various tasks to which he is obliged. At first, he is obliged, responsible, to the task of preserving life for the duration of his developmentally given time. So one of our responsibilities is to preserve life on the planet. We've done just the opposite. We've uh, destroyed all life but human life, and then we also destroy human life. He has to pay heed to the fulfillment of the duty to further develop himself spiritually and consciously in the best way, and to acknowledge the spiritual evolution as an important truth. We're terribly lagging behind in our spiritual evolution here on the earth. We're pushing forward ahead in technology, and we should put more of an emphasis on our spiritual growth. As a community creature, he is obliged, responsible for the task of preserving his species and to instruct and educate his offspring in the meaning of the spiritual teachings, another horrible area of failure. But further, the task 
is imposed on him to align and integrate himself into a naturally ordered community, which does likewise guarantee an evolution in every relation, as nature visibly and livingly examples. The preservation of the human species is not based on a formula, a simple formula, as many of the uh, earthly religions teach. So, according to these extraterrestrials, the Earth is able to carry about 500 million human life forms. We, we now probably don't even know what our population is. It's 8 billion or it's 9 billion. Uh, and this is an irrational problem that will have more and more issues as we continue to uh, go on. Now, the law, the truth of population is calculated this way. The truth of the natural law for nourishment and preservation of life is that there should, per square kilometer of prolific land, that's land that can be truly farmed, there should be no more than 12 human life forms permitted to live in that area. Now that is, boy, that's really excellent. Now we are in some areas so contra- concentrated with people, we build high rises. You know, in order to cram all the people into the area, a square kilometer prolific land is able to nourish 12 human life forms without worry, next to all the present animals of free nature and the animals of human needs, without the human bringing his uh, sense of disorder to things. And and when we get the population down, it will start to solve a lot of other problems. Uh, the wilderness will grow back and the weather will start to become more moderate again. The diseases will be muffled because overpopulation is a perfect environment for disease to spread in these slums that I was talking about. Uh, environmental problems related to air pollution and some of the water pollution problems that we have will be solved and it will it will bring love and harmony to the earth again because people will have all that they need. Uh, it will help reduce the problem of war. There will be less conflict. So these are the the warnings of the level that's called Arahat Athosata, which is, you know, these are human beings that have evolved all the way up into a purely spiritual stage. That's the seventh level of evolution. Again, according to Meyer information, we're still down at level two, trying to... Um, the the stages of evolution kind of go like this. There's There's primitive life, then there's rational life, which we're said to be at the rational life stage, although we don't act very rational. There's intelligent life. The fourth stage is real life. The fifth stage is creational life, life and creational wisdom. The sixth stage is a half spiritual, half physical stage. And the seventh stage is a a purely spiritual plane. And the first step in that spiritual plane is Arahat Athrasada. So I'm going to try to play a clip that talks a little bit about overpopulation. Uh, This is David Suzuki. You know, there are a lot of things that we can fix in this world. We can do something about it. We can design the cities that we live in, the kinds of houses we live in, the market, the economy, currency, how many trees we're going to cut, how many fish we're going to catch. Those things human beings can manage and control because we create them and do them. But some things are facts of life. We have to live with the speed of light, gravity, uh, entropy, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Those are things that we have to accept and work ourselves around. And there is another one that is absolutely crucial. It's a mathematical reality called exponential growth. If something is growing at 1% a year, it'll double in 70 years. 2% 2% a year, it'll double in 35 years. 3% a year in 24 years. 4%, 17 and a half years. Anything growing exponentially 
will double in a predictable length of time. Now, I'm going to show you why all of this stuff about we got to keep growing, keep the economy growing, we've got to keep everything growing, is ultimately suicidal. I'm going to give you a system analogous to the planet, and that's a test tube full of food for bacteria. So the test tube and food is the planet, and the bacteria are us. Now, I'm going to introduce one bacterial cell in, and it's going to divide every minute. That's exponential growth. So at time zero, at the beginning, there's one cell. One minute, there are two. Two minutes, there are four. Three minutes, there are eight. Four minutes, 16. That's exponential growth. And at 60 minutes, the test tube is completely packed with bacteria, and there's no food left. So we have a 60-minute growth cycle. When is the test tube only half full? Well, of course, the answer is at 59 minutes. Even though it's been chugging along for 59 minutes, it's only half full, but one minute later, it'll be completely filled. So that means at 58 minutes, it's 25% full. 57 minutes, it's 12.5% full. At 55 minutes of a 60-minute cycle, it's 3% full. At uh, 55 minutes, one of the bacteria says, Hey, guys, I've been thinking, we got a problem. we got a population problem. The other bacteria would say, Jack, what the hell have you been smoking, man? 97% of the test tube's empty, and we've been around for 55 minutes. And they'd be five minutes away from filling it. So, say bacteria are no smarter than humans. At 59 minutes, they go, oh my God, Jack was right. We got one minute left. What are we going to do? Well, don't give any money to those economists that are saying we got to keep growing all the time. Uh, give it to those scientists. So they massively inject money into the scientific community. And guess what? In less than a minute, those bacterial scientists invent three new test tubes full of food. That'd be like us finding three more planets that we could use. What happens? At 60 minutes, the first test tube's full. 61 minutes, the second's full. 62 minutes, all four are full. By quadrupling the amount of food in space, we buy two extra minutes. Our home is the biosphere. It's fixed and finite. It can't grow. And we've got to learn to live within that finite world. Every scientist I've talked to agrees with me. We've already passed the 59th minute. Well, wow, that's um, very uh, humbling, very uh, stunning. Uh, we're at the 59th minute in the test tube already. So we're there. We're very much there. Roughly 4 million people are born on the street and die on the street in India every year. 18 million people starve to death every year in the world. There are about 9,000 newborns per hour over the number of deaths. 10 million children die every year from starvation. The world population grows by about 77 million people annually. And America is destined to add about 100 million people by 2035 because of immigration. So immigration is probably our second biggest issue that we have to uh, get a handle on. So anyway, I wanted to re revisit... Uh, some more information on overpopulation. Not my favorite topic by any means, <laughs> but it's such a horrible fact of reality on the earth. I wanted to talk about one of these creational natural laws we've uh, discussed a little bit before. It's on page 100 in the book called The Way to Live. It says, in the striving for that which is higher, for evolution, for the highest possible, absolutely full development, as in the case with creation itself, every single reason of any kind, from the very first breath to its very last, also strives for that which is higher, for evolution and completion. Every moment in the existence of a wizen is just as much directed as striving, as in the entire being of the creation itself. The creation itself, as well as all its creatures, are Wiesenheiten. They are imbued with the power of striving. In order to attain success, the future progress, and that which is higher striving, is the power of the spiritual as well as the physical. And striving is an incontrovertible creational law. 
in order to reach through incessant evolution, that which is higher and absolutely fully developed, the greatest power in every single vision is there to serve the striving. And truthfully, the striving is the great and enormous power itself. Striving is the er law of all evolution and of all absolutely full development. And striving is the power of life in the sense of progress. If the striving is absent in some life form, then the power of the progress extinguishes, and thereby the sense of the life. If a human being loses his or her striving, then he or she also loses the sense of life. You talk about the importance of keeping your thinking correct. Because if you don't keep focused on striving, listen to what can happen here. If the human being can no longer strive for anything at all then in himself, herself, or he, or he or she feels with deadly might that he or she is no longer of any use to anything and that as a human being he or she has become, that has become impossible. And it, and it goes on and talks about how, how the person can eventually feel suicidal. So you have to really focus on striving, continue to work, find all your areas of work, you know, your day job, even if you don't have one, focus on your hobbies, on on your work around your house. You have to continue striving, you have to continue improving yourself. It's absolutely uh, essential to your strival, your your survival. And if you falter in striving, then you will very much falter in life. So stay focused in your striving. Now, there are some staggering uh, prophecies that are talked about for the people here in North America. And um, I seem to be going over all the things that are most difficult for me to discuss but let me quickly talk about the Henoch prophecies because the Henoch prophecies are possibilities that could occur here in the U.S. One of those possibilities, and I'm still thinking we're going to be able to get away away from this, that we're going to wake up, that we're going to start doing the right things. It says here, even when the North American continent will be stricken by the most terrible catastrophe which has ever been recorded. Evil military powers will wreak havoc with computerized and nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, whereby it will all happen that computerized weapons will become independent and cannot be controlled any longer by human beings. And these computerized weapons are supposed to really cause some just horrible catastrophes here in the North American continent. Now, let's hope that doesn't happen. It also talks about in the Hanak Prophecies how we could have two civil wars here in America. And I'm hoping that that won't happen as well. Um, that we can start to get around some of these these issues. I'm going to cover, and I don't know how much time I'm going to put into this, another controversial topic with the Meyer material. Sometimes I wake up with this stuff on my mind and I I uh, almost wish I didn't at times. Um, one of the things that y- you may find interesting is that the, um, the, the, the name, we, well, let me put it this way. The letter J is the youngest letter in in the alphabet, in our English alphabet, and not only the English alphabet, but also uh, the German, the the French. In fact, the letter J did not exist in any of the ancient languages on earth, not in the uh, Aramaic, not in the Hebrew, not in the Greek. Now, that poses a bit of a problem. Uh, although it's it's not talked about very often. Because if you read through the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, you come across all kinds of people that have the name that begins with the letter J. 
Well, this did not come into uh, being until many, many years later. In other words, the original, even in the English translations of the original Bible, whether it's the Gutenberg Bible, or and I believe in the first King James Bible as well, the letter J did not appear. Uh, the letter J, uh, for example, was not in the Old English uh, alphabet. Uh, the 1611 version of the King James Bible had no letter J in it as well. Uh, the letter J is the youngest letter of the alphabet. And the le letter J never existed until maybe about 1550 or something like that. There was a guy named Gian Giorgio Tarissino, which first explicitly distinguished the letter I and the letter J. And he basically uh, invented the letter J. Now, what they ended up doing is going back into those old scriptures and um, started changing names. And they, did, and they changed the name drastically, too. Um, I had a very interesting guest on oh, maybe three weeks ago. His name was Stephen Pigeon, and he's a lawyer. And uh, it wasn't really what we had planned to talk about, but I had to ask him if he had studied the stuff that I'm talking about right now. And in fact, he had. Um, and and we talked about, for example, many people say that the term Yeshua, which is the Hebrew word for Joshua, was transliterated into the word we have in English now, Jesus. And the transliteration went something like I-E-S-O-U-S, -S, or Isus, as it's sometimes called in the Greek, and then the Latin Iesus, and then finally into the term Jesus. What was really interesting about that discussion is that he talked about the fact that the, the, the names for James and John were so completely different than what appears in our Bible today. And now, this is a guy who's really strongly, intensely Christian, but he's aware of this fact. He's, he's, he's aware of the fact that you know, what they did was, and they went in and they changed the names of all these uh, people in the, in, the, in the New Testament. And they even did it to the Old Testament. For example, the book of Job was originally called the book of um, IOB. So, and, and, and we got off on a long discussion. It was, it was quite interesting. And the, the reason I stumbled upon this is because one of the areas of the Meyer material that just I was very skeptical about, and, and I am still a little bit to this day, um, is the whole story of Emmanuel. You know, the uh, Meyer material says the spirit form of Edward Albert Meyer has reincarnated on the earth for, this is the seventh time, and that he had been in previous lives, Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. Well, as a side note, they weren't called by the same names in the past. It wasn't it wasn't Enoch, it was Hanok, and it wasn't Elijah, it was Eliah, and it wasn't Jeremiah, it was Jeremiah or something of that nature. So just keep that in mind. But the the central figure here is the name Emmanuel. And the Meyer material says Emmanuel was the true person that lived. And what we have in the New Testament is kind of a fictionalized version of of a man's uh, life. And I, I really didn't buy that completely. And I, you know, I, I was very resistant to that idea. So I started doing some research on, you know, on the name Jesus. And lo and behold, it found out that logically... And, and a lot of scholars know this. Logically, there is no way that in the ancient world there was a person named Jesus or James or John or Joshua, for that matter. They weren't called by those names because there was no J sound in any of our ancient languages. So, and I was, you know, blown away once again that the Meyer material turns out to be right. Well, 
Even more controversial is this book called the Talmud of Emmanuel, which some scholars will say was really the source book for the book of Matthew. And the book of Mark, Luke, and John eventually came from that as well. Um, And there's a whole story behind that about how Issa Rashid and Billy had discovered this book and how Issa Rashid started the translation process. Issa Rashid had sent a portion of the book to Billy, and eventually he he was killed by the um, Mossad, the Secret Service of the uh, Israel, and his family was machine gunned to death. And um, but a certain portion of this ancient scroll, the Talmud of Emmanuel, was preserved in the Meyer material. The Meyer people, the Figu people, uh, tried to get it published, and and, the, and then. There's a lot of story around that, and the first version was had problems in it, and things never got corrected. So supposedly there's a new version that's coming out now, which is a better translation and has uh, uh, more information in it that is helpful. I also wanted to cover something else along the lines of the name uh, of Jesus. Um, one thing that you'll see on the ancient paintings is an acronym called INRI. And uh, in INRI, that's a, an acronym which stands for IESUS, which again is the um, transliteration of the name Jesus, IESUS Nazarenus Rex Iodorium. And today we read that as Jesus, the Nazarene King of the Jews. But we substitute the word Jesus for Iesus, I-E-S-U-S. So I just thought that was another proof. So you can verify that for yourself. You can verify any of this for yourself if you look it up. It's it's documented. Um, I want to also talk a little bit about human nature. Uh, this afternoon and in the remaining time because uh, good or evil what is the human nature and the gobble of the truth tells us that no human being is fundamentally evil and that we are not genetically programmed by nature to be evil uh, things like revenge and dishonesty and hatred and jealousy and all this falseness is something that we develop during the course of our life. A spirit form is always neutral positive. And it's a child is neutral positive. And we evil is 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 something that's learned according to my information. Some synonyms for evil are deranged, demented, disturbed, insane. The German word bos is a, a word that's translated as evil. Gewalt has nothing to do with um, uh, the terms violence. It's an old Lyrian term, which even is more intense than than the the thought of violence. So, um, our behavior patterns, if they're negative like this, are very contagious. And they can spread from person to person. Uh, let me read another section from the Gobble of the Truth and what it has to say about this idea of evil. When the abyss of the evil opens, it is not seldom the case that they open so wide that a human being has, who has lapsed into evil can no longer find his way back to the good. And if a person has been evil, that doesn't mean that they have to stay that way, that they can change, they can improve themselves. The truth is that evil in the human being is learned by him or her during their lifetime, something which can happen even from childhood and later. Genetic programming only imposes on human being beings reaction patterns and protection mechanisms, uh, but it doesn't force us into evil. Uh, the Goblet of Truth talks a little bit about the brain stem and that that we have an unconscious reaction process to threats. And and this is something that happens automatically. 
so we have a very active unconscious mind, and that is sometimes where some of these negative thoughts come from. And this, one of the things we have to do is very much monitor our thoughts. And here's what here's what it says here uh, when it talks about evil and behavior patterns of human be- beings. The behavior of an individual is able to be contagious to many others because the human brain, respectively, the thoughts proceeding from out of the consciousness and the feelings resulting from them are able to infect one another. We are not genetically programmed for evil. Evil is a learned behavior. So just because we have fallen into evil does not mean that we cannot come back to what is healthy and natural. And these evil behavior patterns are very contagious. So we have to be careful about that. So we have fallen into a behavior pattern of overpopulation. And it's something that can be corrected and it will take time for people to relearn what they should know already, which is respect and venerability towards the entirety of nature and creation and its laws and recommendations. This should be what our thoughts are about and what our feelings are about and that we must learn to live in harmony with creation and with nature and with the earth and the universe. And if we don't do that, then we will continue to destroy the planet that we live on. And it's ironic that in a way our own prosperity is destroying the planet faster than anything. Now one thing that the Meyer material talks about is that all creatures have a spirit form and that many creatures are connected by something called the psychic swinging wave. And the psychic swinging wave is um, something that operates unconsciously. It's a connection. The gamut supplies the psyche. The gamut controls the thoughts and the feelings of the spiritual consciousness. The psyche controls the thoughts and the feelings of the material consciousness. But this gamut, as part of your spirit form, supplies the psyche with these swinging waves. And these swinging waves are an important key to understanding what's going on in the human spirit. And it's also something that occurs in nature. When we see uh, the birds as they move together in a unit, and the same way with the fish, they're connected by this unseen force. Well, there, I really think there is something else going on here with humanity now, is that we're finally starting to develop a collective subconscious which is working more and more and more. And this is going to be a little... um, My evidence of this is maybe obscure to most. But one thing that's happening in the software industry is the development of what you might call free um, software, free open source software, which is having a huge impact on... um, the industry. See, we work in a uh, capitalistic society which is all about making money. Well, the the software industry has gone to the next level to focus on productivity rather than making money. Let me give you a perfect example. There is a um, web server out there, And if you don't know what a web server is, it's what serves up the web pages when you're on the Internet, when you're surfing from page to page. One of these web servers uh, is is from IBM. It's called WebSphere. And it costs companies hundreds of thousands of dollars to use these. Well, there's something that's come out called Tomcat, which is free, which works just as well. So people are moving off of that. There are these giant databases that exist all over the world which 
are built using this software called Oracle. Well, Oracle costs companies hundreds of thousands of dollars to to every year to keep these databases up. Well, there's some software uh, for databases called Postgres, which is completely, totally free. And companies are moving to that. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is I think that there's something else operating here in the subconscious collectively of people all over the world. And we are communicating with one another. We know about our common existence among one another. And the consciousness and psyche, as it says in the Goblet of Truth, of all created creations are bound together. And we're all in this journey through time together, and we're starting to learn cooperation. And it's really interesting to see what will happen as we develop this uh, communication. And it's an unconscious. It's not conscious completely. It's something that's going on subconsciously. Now, the passage that I was talking about there in the Goblet of Truth it was talking about that we live in a tightly woven web of life. And woven means to interlace, like threads, yarn, strips, fibrous material. It means to cross over one another, to pass alternatively over and under, to intertwine. And at this point, creation then is indissoluble. It means you can't really pull one thing out without really affecting everything else. And it says here in the Goblet of Truth, this is the basis for the tightly woven and indissoluble web of all life. And this wise no life form strives up to rise over others within their group. And that's what I'm talking about with the collective subconscious. And I think it's working in the software programming field is that we're realizing that when something rises up, over the others and sets themselves up above others like some of these corporations do, that it's a negative thing always because each life form contains a basic goodness. And that's why there has to be this um, equality. It's, it's something that uh, Billy has talked about here in the... Um, in the uh, the way to live here, and it kind of goes along with striving, as well. Let me continue here. So many, I think, what is happening is you will see things like nationalism, fascism, neo-capitalism, materialism slowly start to fade away because these philosophies that we have are an immense threat to the people of the earth, particularly in the third millennium. And if we don't start to grow out of cynical materialism and neo-capitalism, then we will continue to cause the serious damage to nature and the damage to our thought processes. Because we have a tendency to focus on materialism, a kind of intellectual materialism that moves away from anything spiritual. And we have, if we continue down the current thought patterns, that there will be a primitive kind of anarchy that results. And an anarchy is a state of society without government or law. Because the 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 neo capitalism the uh, cynical materialism that we have will continue to cause these the civil unrest and you're starting to see more civil unrest and we have been living under an established evil called consciousness condition tyranny and this tyranny of our consciousness started in the old Roman military tyranny. And it's 
spread into this tyrannical kind of thinking has moved into um, our neo-capitalism, our, our, our corporations. And we have to break out of this consciousness condition tyranny that's forced us into thinking what the group says we should think. And this is was most obvious as seen in the um, church structure that we have today. And we have to break out of the, the effects that this religious and sectarian narrow-mindedness that causes a blindness to things that is incredible. And Billy talks about in the Goblet of Truth that the earth once blossomed before these philosophies came about, before these false ideologies and philosophies and religions and sex. And there wasn't so much greed, and there wasn't so much materialism. And at that time, there were n- n- nearly as many, not nearly as many wars. And so we have to change our thinking and work more in um, a way of cooperation. Let me let me make a, a quick analogy here. Um, uh, one thing we we talk about is intellectual property, which I find very uh, humorous. Now, it does. It's true that we have intellectual property. Now, I'm not I'm not trying to say that that isn't true. But in a way, it's kind of absurd that our materialism has gotten so large that now we try to claim ownerships of things that aren't even physical. Now, intellectual things, and the most extreme of this is the music industry. Music is not physical. It's, it's vibrations. It's waves going through the air. But the, the, the record companies now claim ownership over things, songs, they didn't even invent that some group of musicians that got together invented. And now they charge, uh, they charge people money for listening to music that they didn't even invent in the first place, that isn't even physical. It's not a physical thing. And you think this isn't a big deal, well, if you go to places, um, even wineries that want to play music, they ha- they are charged for playing this music. Uh, these uh, there's incredible monthly fees. So these uh, philosophies, these ideas that we have, are very, very malignant and unhealthy. And we have to start breaking away from some of these philosophies and get back to what the Meyer material calls the effective truth. The effective truth stands for life-giving energy and for life itself. And this life-affirming creational energy links human beings directly to the laws and recommendations of creation. And the power is still there and it fills the entire earth. The same energy wants to achieve harmonious concord with all life. The creation, the superintelligence, which runs all things, wants to come into concord, um, a kind of union with all life, all human beings, the planet, and the universe. And we need to change our thinking in order to do that and understand these creational natural laws that we've talked about, the law of love, the law of striving, the law of harmony, which is neutral positive thinking. Uh, Your thoughts should be perfectly balanced with a slight tendency towards positive. They should not be negative. If you ever find yourself slowly drifting into the negative, it's 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 a very very destructive thing, and it shouldn't happen. 
And you need to always monitor your thoughts. And people in ancient times knew this. Uh, One of which was a man named Merlin, who I talked about before. Merlin somehow got a hold of some of the teachings of Hanok. And Hanok, one of the, well, there were actually three Hanoks, three uh, that we call Enoch today. That one about 13,500 years ago, one about 4,500 years ago, and one about uh, 9,000 years ago, I think. Uh, and this teaching was the same kind of teaching that we have today in the Meyer information. And Merlin, who was one of the cohorts of King Arthur, got a hold of some of the writings. Merlin was a Druid prince. He was a teacher, he was a historian, and he lived in South Wales. And uh, he was part of the Celtic people in the Iron Age. I think it was, oh, geez, roughly 1200 um, B.C. is when the Iron Age, Age started, but I think uh, Merlin came um, maybe in the 2nd or 3rd century. I don't even exactly remember. But he was a legendary figure associated with the King Arthur legend. And there was a castle named Dinas Brian where he lived. And uh, Merlin developed the ability to see into the future because he meditated. And because he studied these old writings of Henoch, which were also called the Cauldron of Life. And Merlin was considered a seer, and he would he would write down these prophecies that would often come true. Some of these prophecies were were written down years later, like as late as eleven hundred AD. And uh, one of the, some of these prophecies are and I can't even pronounce this. The Prophecies of Merlin, I guess you would say in our language today, which talked about this great struggle between the the British people and the Saxons that would occur. And um, and it, anyway, King Arthur wasn't the uh, wonderful person that we sometimes think of today. He was kind of a brutal man. And uh, Merlin was the man with integrity. And he was actually supposedly given a sword, which today we call Excalibur. And it was actually a a form of technology that he allegedly got from this woman named Caridwina, who is supposedly Ptah's great aunt, if you remember from the Meyer material. And uh, Merlin used this for a while, this weapon, and somehow... Uh, King Arthur got a hold of it, and uh, King Arthur killed many people with this weapon. Uh, Merlin eventually got it back, and I believe that uh, this player and Caridwina eventually took it back and and kind of moved it off the earth. But um, this is an interesting side tangent I, I, I got off on where we were talking about some of the the history of the wrong thinking that's gone on the earth. Anyway, we've kind of blurred into other topics here, and uh, I think we're about running out of time. And I appreciate everyone to come to the show and the people in the chat room. We've been uh, studying the Meyer material, the Way to Live book, Creation and Overpopulation, and we'll talk to you next week. Have a good evening.